And what percentage of the DUI cases that you've fought, you know, have, have gone to court versus settled out of court or gone to trial, I mean? Um, I think you're going to find that on any of these cases, most of them do not go to trial. It's not a matter of the percentages. It's a matter more of the police report. It's a matter of the attorney's ability to represent his client effectively. And I think you're going to find a good attorney that has a good case may not need to fight it at trial. They may be able to get the case handled well before that. They may be able to get it handled either through negotiations. They may be able to get it handled through uh, motions, which, you know, you may not have to go to trial to get it handled. At the same time, the cases that are just no good, they're, they're just dog cases. They're not, you're not going to be able to win the case no matter what you do, and it doesn't matter how good the attorney is. Okay. Those cases, you're going to want to do what you can to mitigate the damages. You're going to want to see if you can keep them from having to go to jail. You're going to want to see if you can keep them from having to do lots and lots of public work service. If they're having uh, financial problems, you're going to see if you can get them on a payment plan for any fine that they have. You need to look at each client on an individual basis, and that's what my office tries to do. Okay. And what is your best tip You know, when someone's been driving – they had a few drinks. Um, they've just been pulled over, and you know the police are approaching the car. What what should they do? What shouldn't they do? I, I say this not because I'm a defense attorney, not because I'm any type of attorney, or even because of my personal feelings towards the police. When you get pulled over for DUI, the policeman is not your friend. He's not your buddy. He's not somebody that you should be doing a whole lot of talking to. He's not there to help you prevent yourself from getting a DUI. Um, he's there for one reason, to collect evidence against you, to arrest you, to put you in jail, and to give you a criminal record. Okay. So for that reason, um, I guess the best thing you can do is give him your license. If he asks questions, simply say, officer, I don't think I need to answer that. The only thing that you do have to do when you get pulled over is you have to take a blood or breath test. That doesn't mean you have to take the preliminary alcohol screen that he has right with him. A blood or breath test is done at the police station or at the jail. Um, you can't refuse that because you'll lose your license for a longer period of time. However, on the apart from that, you don't need to do the uh, field sobriety test. You don't need to blow into the PAS, the preliminary alcohol screen. You don't need to say anything. All you say is, here's my license. I don't want to answer any questions. Okay. I do not refuse to do the blood or breath test at the police station, but I do not want to do the preliminary alcohol screen here at the scene. All of those are being done not to help you keep yourself out of getting charged with a DUI. They're being done so they can charge you with a DUI. So don't do them. So what kinds of help can you provide to DUI defendants? Can you, for instance, you know, possibly reduce their time in jail or you know, reduce the amount of fees they pay? The this is an individualized question. Um, each case is different, and I know that's attorney speak for wiggle talk, wiggle, wiggle room. Lots of attorneys don't want to answer that because the truth of the matter is each case is different. With that being said, when there's something that I'm able to do, let's say reduce jail time, let's say that's reduce fines, let's say that's reduce the classes for some reason, um, reduce the amount of time that you're driving without a license. Um, if there's other charges, reduce the time that you're going to jail for the other charges, if that ends up being the case. Yes, that happens pretty frequently. Um, I, I hate to say that's one and two or one and three or, you know, two and three, you know, I, I, 
it's it's a very individualized matter. Um, with that being said, I'd say my office's ability to have charges reduced or jail time reduced or something something done for my client is is pretty strong. I, I can't say that it's you know, 100 percent, obviously, um, but I would say that I have either through skill or luck pretty good results with my clients. Um, I, I, but I hate to give you a number just because I it, it depends. It depends on the case in terms of what my historical numbers been. I'd say anywhere from on on cases that I'm able to do something where there's a good legal argument. I'd say I'm anywhere from. 50 to 100 percent of having some sort of result for my client. Okay. And that's probably the best way I can answer with not not giving in too much in terms of the wiggle room, but at the same time, I know people want answers, and if they're watching this video, they're watching for a reason they want answers. Right. What? How about for uh, clients that are in the military? Is it um, is it different for them? As I said before, you're Clients in the military have what's called non-judicial punishment. Um, sometimes they can be looking at things like court-martial, but most of the time they're looking at NJP. What that means in terms of an individualized basis, they're going to be going to court, they're going to be going in front of the DMV, and they're also going to be going in front of their commanding officers for non-judicial punishment. Non-judicial punishment can be anything from... Um, a demotion in rank, it can be time without pay, it can be a lot of different things. Um, depending on the officer, depending on the client, and depending on their relationship, we've had luck with having everything from no non-judicial punishment, even when they ended up being convicted on the civil side, to having them have some sort of non-judicial punishment that is less than what they were originally looking at. The difference with military is there's no set criteria for what that non-judicial punishment is. It depends on where they're stationed, who their commanding officers are, and their relationship with those commanding officers. It also depends on the commanding officer's general feelings about their attorney, their clients having attorneys. Some officers do not like that. Some officers are pleased that the um, person is taking the case so seriously that they brought an attorney with them. Hmm. And each of those, it, it depends. There's a lot of depending criteria, but yes, it is different because they're looking at three sets of punishment, not just two. So is it wise to take a DUI case to trial or to try to settle beforehand? You know, if it's not an aggravated set of circumstances, if it's more of a run-of-the-mill case... I think, as I said before, you're looking at most of these cases do not go to trial. Um, with that being said, it depends on what is at stake. Um, for example, I also had said I had a uh, couple pilots before that if they lost their or they lost their case, they'd also be losing their license, which means that they would have an inability to work for at least a year. Um, that's a long time, and when the stakes are that high, I think it's smart to go to trial or to get some sort of reduced, uh, some sort of some something reduced, whether that's the charging code or whether that's um, sometimes I've been able to negotiate where they get charged with a completely different crime, but they have some different penalties that they wouldn't have otherwise, okay. uh, and it. It really depends on what the stakes are because when you go to trial, it costs a lot of money. And that's not just for the attorney. It just costs a lot of money through and through, and it's a gamble. You're not necessarily going to win. You're not necessarily going to lose a trial. Hmm. It's a roll of the dice. Hmm. 